Now, the impact of the crisis arising from resistance to alleged criminal activities of suspected herdsmen in parts of Nigeria's southwest continues to put enormous pressure on the already overstretched socio-political fault lines of the country. And joining us now to have a comprehensive look at this problem from a background of historical perspectives about how cow herding and inter-ethnic relationships in Nigeria is um, Husman Yusuf, a former executive secretary of the National Health Insurance Scheme. Professor Yusuf, who is a professor of hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplantation, has been a very vocal observer and an activist against Hertzman banditry across the northwestern flanks of Nigeria. Welcome to the program, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, Professor well. Yusuf, thank you for joining us. Very quickly, what's your take on what is happening in Undo State and also your state uh, between those you probably call the indigents and then those they call the Fulani Hesmen, who have been accused of rape, uh, violation of the space, land grabbing, extortion, kidnapping, and, you know, there have been various reactions to this. Uh, from both sides of the aisle, uh, voices of uh, reason and protest in the uh, southwest, and also counter-reactions uh, coming from the north. And then specifically, I'd like you to comment on how, so far, the Buhari administration has tried to handle this. Good. Uh, thank you, Ruben, for having me. Uh, as you know, this is not the first time I've been on this forum. I've been here several times in the past, from, from Zabarmari to Basari to, to, to Sokoto, all over the country. When things happen, we come here. Now it's gone to the southwest. Uh, I don't know why anybody is surprised, because I'm not surprised. We have been here severally speaking about insecurity, how pervasive it is, and how insecurity in one place is a herbinger for insecurity everywhere. But many people think, oh, because it doesn't happen in my place, it will not happen anywhere. The twist this time is dangerous, and I'll tell you why it's dangerous. We in the North, have lived with our Yoruba brothers and Igbo brothers for generations. If you go to cities in, in, in the north, like Kaduna, Zaria, Funtua, uh, Gusau, Kaurenamoda, Nguru, Gombe, and Jos, you will find Yorubas that have lived there generations that have been assimilated, that uh, you don't even know who is who. Long, up to over 100 years. These cities uh, used to be railway, uh, railway junctions. We have lived peacefully. And there is no market, there is no village in this country. You will not go and see a Yoruba man or an Igbo man. There are more Yorubas living in the north than the hundreds of ethnic groups in the north living in the southwest. There are more Igbos living in the north peacefully than there are any of the hundred ethnic groups in the north living in the southeast. So we need to be very, very, very careful. This is not the first time you have conflict between ethnic groups. But when elders and when adults do not stand up and speak up, things get out of hand. See what happened in Oyo, that gentleman? I mean, the fact that we will allow, the Southwest will allow this kind of person to dictate the narrative of this time and this politics, it says a lot. The issue is there is failure of leadership everywhere. Banditry is a failure of leadership in the Fulani community. Boko Haram is a failure of leadership in, in, the, in the Kanuri community. So also the Niger Delta. 
And we saw that in, in uh, during ANSAS. There was no leadership. That was why you call them you call them hoodlums. They were nothing but insurrectionists. That there were no adults to call them to order. In the South is too. We see IPOP, Nam Kanu calling the shots. A failure of leadership. It is time for our leadership everywhere, and not government. Every one of us, you, I, everybody, we are leaders in our communities. We need to stand up and take the reign of leadership of our communities from these thugs. Because essentially that is what they are. I was here and I spoke a great length about the consequence of answers and how we were this close to this country imploding. And now we are into this. I am the greatest critic of this government when it comes to insecurity, especially of banditry to my people. We've seen that. I am from Katsina. The president is from Katsina. I've never been shy calling the president and his government and the Buhari or Shimbanjo government on insecurity. Now it's gone everywhere. It's the time for adult voices to be heard. What we are doing locally in our community, without government knowing, without anybody asking us to do, all of us, is reaching out to our traditional rulers, reaching out to our clerics, all across the north. And that is why you see Sheikh Ahmed Gumi going into the Rugas and meeting Fulanis in their Rugas, in the, in the forest, and, and, and talking to them. And that is why you see Reverend Yakubu Pam intervening in the Southern Kaduna crisis. This is leadership. No government asked them to do that. We cannot sit down here and expect, oh, Buhari, or Shimbanjo, or Buratai to take care of our security. We have a role and a responsibility. There are irresponsible politicians that are fueling all of this. And they need to be very, 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 very careful. I'll give you an example. In June 2017, when the youth in the North gave an, uh, an eviction order to Ibos to vacate the North by October, to, uh, October 1st, 2017, the president was out of the country in the hospital. The first person that spoke was the Sultan of Sokoto. And the Amir of Katsina, where I come from, was on the front page of Daily Trust, condemning these kids. A Northern Elders Forum, call, forum called them. And all our traditional rulers called Igbo leaders to douse the tension. Now is the time for Yoruba elders to stand up and speak up. And for the government to do what I've always said, the government has not done what it needs to do in terms of security. I have severally on these occasions, and I have written that we need to have forest rangers. If we had forest rangers, they would be guarding our forests all over the country. And the governor of Ando would not ask uh, uh, herders that are there legally to vacate. We need forest rangers, our forests all over the country are ungoverned. And I have said, no nation will call itself secure if it does not have control of its airspace, of its highways, of its forests, and of its waterways. We see we do not have control of our highways. That's why we cannot go safely from Kaduna to Abuja. We don't have control of our forests. That's why we have bandits. This is where they do their nefarious activities, where they take people to. We don't have control of our waterways. That's why we had problems in the Niger Delta. And it's not about reconfiguring, restructuring, retweaking, re whatever the security. No. Community elders and leaders need to be involved in all of this. Okay. Abuja plan will never work, has never worked. We are in the twilight years of this administration. It has gone 75%. We are now in the fourth quarter. We have two more years left, essentially one active year. The next year will be politicking. We need to sit down, security agents, the government need to involve community elders, our religious leaders, our traditional rulers, our elders, to snuff out these kids. They're essentially kids. Born in 1972, he is the one causing trouble in the Southwest. He's the Inamdi Kanu of the Southwest, calling for ethnic cleansing. It's not acceptable. 
We need to be very careful because we do not know where trouble will go. Nobody in this country has anything to gain by trouble. Mm. We have a lot, a lot to gain by living in peace as we have lived over the last 60 years and, and, and many more to come. Restructuring, re-rotation, re whatever, whatever has to be done in a very civil way. Nobody gets to presidency through threats, through, through, through violence, through insults. We sit down and talk. And ethnic cleansing is a no-no. Every Nigerian has a right to live everywhere, but live peacefully and legally. Nobody will, okay. I, Fulani, I look, I am a Fulani 100%. All right. Uh, I cannot be profiled when I go anywhere. They say, oh, you are this, you are that. And, but and Fulani is mostly peacefully with the me. communities they are in. And that's going to be my yeah, next I can question. Hear you. Uh, increasing profiling of a tribe and the risk of criminalizing and um, of a particular tribe, which is the Fulani tribe in this instance. But we'll go on a quick break and we'll be back to talk some more. Please stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show. We still have with us from our Abuja studios, Professor Husman Yusuf, who is the former executive secretary of the National Health Insurance Scheme, uh, with us on the program. Thank you so much for staying with us, Professor. And we were talking about profiling before that break. There's the risk of criminalizing and stigmatizing the Fulani tribe in all of this. But would you say that there's been enough uh, vehement denouncement, rejection uh, by critical stakeholders. I mean, you say you're, you're speaking out a lot, but is that enough? It, how important is it for us to see legitimate Fulani herders denounce, dissociate themselves from these cr criminal elements that are infiltrating them? Yeah, who is legitimate, who is illegitimate, how do you know who, who is legitimate, who is illegitimate? I'll tell you what happens in, in I have a friend who has his cattle in, 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 in Ghana. Mm. You don't hear cattle rustling in Ghana. Why? Because they're, 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 they're full any herders in the forest are all biometrically identified. You see a full any man there, a herder with thousands of heads of cattle. And they are licensed to carry arm. You don't hear rustling. So we need to, we need to, who are the leaders of the Fulani? The Mieti Allah are the leaders of the, 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 the Fulani herdsmen. But ever, ever, ever uh, traditional ruler in the north, in the north, north, from Sokoto to Ilorin to, to Katsuna to Zaria to, 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 to Yola, they are all Fulanis. And they have been talking and engaging with these people. The government needs to come in and engage with these people and traditional rulers and religious leaders. This is a threat that is existential to the survival of this country. Nobody has a magic bullet. Nobody. We cannot just sit down, fold our arms, and say government has failed and, 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 and we accept things as is. The failure is the government, the failure is ours. Because we will be asked by those that come after us. What did you do when these things happen? And you will answer that you were here talking to people, trying to find solutions. Security is the responsibility of every Nigerian. Banditry. And insurgency in this country, and cultism and armed robbery, they are existential threat to our country. I have written, I have appeared severally. I am Fulani back and front. I come from Katsina. I am the greatest critic of this government for the way it's handling security, especially banditry in my state and all over the northwest, the north central. Now it's going down to the north, uh, to, to the south. It is time for a dialogue to find out how do we handle this solution. Soldiers, are, the military is everywhere. There is no military in this world that can do what ours is doing. 
They are pulled here, they are pulled there, they are pulled everywhere. They are performing police function. This is not the function of the military. Because the military is not the one that created banditry. They are not the ones that created Boko Haram. They are not the ones that created cultism. Essentially, the bedrock of all of these crimes, I said it, corruption and bad governance is politics. So when politicians mess up, the military is called in to clean up their mess. Okay. How many politicians, how many ministers, how many senators, how many can go home and spend the weekend? Okay, Prof. They're here in Abuja, but they were elected by the people. Okay, Prof. In other countries, it is our electoral representatives that will go and discuss with these people. Okay, Prof. The failure is ours, all of us. Go ahead. Okay, Prof. Uh, you've, you've said a lot. I just want to go straight to you. You talked about the role of leaders to be able to intervene in this conversation. But the man in question here, the Seriki Fulani in the Gongo area, has been there since 1968. I'm not sure if you've ever heard the Seriki Fulani speaks. He doesn't speak Yoruba. He speaks the Oyo Yoruba dialects. That's to show that he's ingrained in the community. He's part of the community. In fact, his Fufulde is not as strong as his Yoruba any longer. And when you see that it's that kind of person that is accused of backing the bandits to perpetrate such acts, I mean, what do you say to that? Right. Um, uh, Rufai, you made a great point. There are Yorubas in, 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 in the north that they speak, they speak more original Hausa than I. And there are Fulanis in the east that speak thick, thick, thick Igbo. So, you see that all over the, country, all over the world. In, in Germany, they were blaming the Jews. In Britain, they say, oh, it's EU, we want Brexit, right? In the US, they say, oh, it's Mexicans that are responsible for this. In Ghana, Fred Akufo and Hila Liman kicked out Yorubas. They say they were responsible for crippling the economy of Ghana. And they moved to, they moved to, to Lome, Togo. In Nigeria, during the 80s, Ghana must go. Ghanaians were kicked out. Has it made Nigeria the Nirvana? No. So when you start ethnicizing, when you start profiling and picking ethnic groups, ethnic minorities, and blaming them for your failures, then there's going to be trouble. Big events begin with small ones if they are not nipped at the bud. So every Nigerian has the right to live everywhere, but live peacefully, and the communities must protect every Nigerian. And I will say this, it is irresponsible for the governor of Ondo State to do what he did. Governorship comes with responsibility. No governor anywhere in this country or traditional ruler should open his mouth and say that. It comes with responsibility. Words matter and leadership matters. It is irresponsible for the governor to evict people anywhere. If there are crimes, if there are issues, they need to be settled. He is the chief security officer of that state. He gets billions of naira every day to take care, every month to take care of security. What do our governors do? We had a time in this country, after the civil war, when we had armed robberies and all that, predominantly from people from the south. But nobody will come and say, oh, it is an Igbo arm robber, oh, it's a Yoruba arm robber, oh, it's an Isa arm robber. No. It is irresponsible for people to do that. So politicians need to be very, very, very careful. They are there to govern, to govern responsibly, to govern everybody that is within their domain. And responsible leaders, need, their voices need to be heard. Elders, traditional rulers, and clerics. Their voices need to be heard. We are all Nigerians. And let me tell you, I see these kids with, with, with cameras shouting, Yoruba Nation, Yoruba Nation, this is Yoruba land, this is Yoruba land. 
The last time I checked, there is only one nation, and that nation is Nigeria. So this is the toxic, toxic things we feed our children on. And they're going to grow up and see only Yorubas are allowed in that neighborhood. Well, Just uh, like we see with Inamdi Kanu. Professor, we should not allow this. Elders need to speak up. Forget political correctness and say the right thing. That's why we're elders. Professor Yusuf. Thank you, Ruben. Yeah, if I may come in here. Yes. <clears throat> I agree with you absolutely that political leaders need to be careful. But in the case of Governor Akiridulu, one thing that can be said in his defense is that he has made it clear that he's not saying every Fulani person should live uh, on those state. He's talking about the forex reserves. Forest reserves. That's what he's talking about, which had now been converted into a zone for kidnapping and extortion and rape and all forms of criminality. That's one point. Secondly, um, I asked you earlier on uh, to do an assessment of how the Buhari administration has responded uh, to what is happening in Ondo State and also in uh, Oyo State. And I asked that question advisedly because our previous guest, before he joined us, Conan Inyam, was accusing uh, President uh, Buhari of lack of patriotism. Well, I don't agree with him on that score. Uh, if you look at the record of President Buhari as a military leader and the efforts he made to become uh, president, I mean, it would be very difficult uh, to sustain the argument uh, that he will be president and he doesn't believe in the idea of Nigeria. You can make your point about criticism, uh, but that would be a very difficult argument uh, to sustain because he remains a statesman. However, are you surprised that Sunday Igbohu, whom you refuse to name, uh, but you refer to him, uh, we were told by Garuba Shewu uh, that the Inspector General of Police had ordered his arrest, but he was not arrested. If anything, he held a meeting with uh, Ngozi Onadeko, the Commissioner of Police, and he will probably also be part of the meeting today. Have we reached a point where certain individuals uh, can be bigger than the system? Yeah, and this is, uh, this is why I say uh, we have a problem. You remember during, during uh, the Shiite uh, riots in Zaria, when al Zazaki and his men were killed, and al Zazaki and his wife have been in prison for the five, six years now? Answers insurrection with burning, looting, burning government property, ransacking the palace of the Oba of Lagos, uh, ransacking police stations, lynching police, uh, police, uh, policemen, busting open jails. Nobody has been brought to book. This is essentially insurrection. We see that in the United States. They are bringing them to book. Ensas was nothing but an insurrection that they've gotten away with murder. Nothing has happened. So, if you allow that to happen, you won't be surprised when you have Igboho defying the governor, who is the chief security officer of the state. The governor told him clearly, do not do what you're going to do. And he did. He defied the governor, assembled hundreds of people, went into that place and burnt the house of, 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 of that Fulani leader. So what's going to happen next? Government needs to do what is right. If there is a crime that there were clearly were during answers and this Iboho guy, people need to bear the full brunt of the law. Our country is governed by law. When you allow lawlessness, you have anarchy. So for anybody to question President Buhari's uh, patriotism, it's, um, I'm a great critic of this president, but that's not one thing you'll criticize of him. In his 20s, he wore the uniform of this country to, 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 to save this country together. He served credibly in all the positions he did. So questioning his, his patriotism is... is, is um, these guys do not know what they're saying. But most importantly, the reasons you have these kids, 
And I call them kid. Igboho was born in 1972 when I went to secondary school. They did not see the war. Namdi Kanu was born in 1967. They had no experience with Biafra war. And the big problem with these kids are, are, are calling the shots, are calling the narratives of this nation. The biggest problem is we stop teaching history to our kids. Any nation that is not teaching history to its children is likely to repeat that history. Look at what is happening currently in Central African Republic. We want Nigeria to be like that. Well, Professor Yusuf, on that note, we need to take a short commercial break. Uh, Professor Yusuf, we'll take a short commercial break, and then we'll come back to you. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. It's still The Money Show. Welcome back to The Money Show here on Arise News. Still with us is Professor Usman Yusuf, former Executive Secretary of the National Health Insurance Scheme, uh, who has been uh, discussing national issues, particularly the crisis uh, involving headers and communities in the uh, southwest of Nigeria. Prof, you were just making a point about some people you described as kids, uh, you know, who were born, according to you, 1972, 1967. Uh, if you may just conclude on that point, and then I just uh, can ask you the next question. Although I don't know whether age should be the matter. Good. So that it should be. I will tell you why. Age in every society, especially in our African society, we respect age, regardless of your degrees or your wealth. And you know that. You're from the Southwest. You know how we respect our elders. And the reason is it comes with wisdom. And not many were able to live that long. So age. In your house, you do not allow your kids to do whatever they want to do. Age comes with wisdom. The, the history of Nigeria, the 60 years we've lived in this country, needs to be taught in schools. Our leaders need to be taught in schools. Our leaders who were assassinated, our leaders who fought for the independence of this country, our leaders who built this country, our leaders who are still ruling this country, needs to be taught in, in, in our history. When we were in primary school, we know Jaja of Opobo, we know the Alafino for your Areo Nakakamfo, we know Amadu Bello, we know Azikiwe, we know. But our kids now, they know nothing. Well, who do they know? Uh, WhatsApp and, and, and Facebook and Yahoo. We are losing. In the United States, you do not become a citizen unless you pass their history. History must be taught in school, at home. You teach your children who, who you are, where you came from, where your grandparents come from. They root these kids. We went into the world because we knew where we came from. We knew where we came from. Our parents were not watching. There was no, there was no phone. There was no TV. But we knew the limit we would do. Our parents were not there. But here you are. You don't teach children anything. And our children, when we elders are sitting... Our children are the ones doing all of this. We sit down and watch them. No, it's not acceptable. Elders need to stand up and speak up loud and clearly. Nigeria is our country. All 200 million of us are equal stakeholders in this country. And we should not allow okay. any person or group of person to jeopardize this country. All right, indeed. Uh, Professor Yusuf, this is the point. I, I, I'd like you to be as brief as you can uh, very quickly. Today, we are expecting a meeting between the Mieti Alakatu Breeders Association and governors from the Southwest. Are you optimistic that this will bring forth a, a lasting solution? Secondly, with the absence of a proper ranching system in the country, you've talked so much about leadership. Is the, are the leaders of the Fulani ethnic uh, region or ethnicity doing enough to disabuse the perceived sense of entitlement of cattle headers to people's farms? Do you think enough has been done in that, in that regard? Right. So uh, the, the meeting between the governors and Miet Allah and the leadership of the Fulani will succeed. And I'll tell you why. Because they all do not have a choice but to make it successful. 
there is no governor in the Southwest that would want to see any bloodshed or any mayhem in his land. And there is no leadership of any Fulani cattle herder that would want to see them dislocated from a land they have lived for generations. So yes, they will make it work, and I'm hopeful, and they will. This is not the first time we've had issues with, with Fulani herders and farmers, especially in the North. We've had it for a very, very long time. And the North has been on the brunt of the, 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 the mayhem that these bandits have caused over, over the years. But we do not paint all of them with the brush of, 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 of being terrorists. And, and people, our elders, our traditional rulers, our clerics, don't come out and speak up. But they are working tirelessly, tirelessly with these communities, with the youth, with the government. We, we, have, we have suffered the brunt of this, of this banditry. Okay. We've lost loved ones. Okay. So okay, it's in the interest of everybody in this country to bring this thing to a close. Okay, Prof. Uh, real quickly, politely, I would like to disagree with you on your stance on ageism. I think that's the reason why Africa has its long held up problems. There are people that might not be of age that are doing well, but being wine is changing the narrative and some other young people around. And I think that's one of the fundamental problems of Nigeria ageism itself. So I politely disagree with you. That's a talk for another day. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Usman Yusuf. Um, well, the forum is not for us to agree on all things. Uh, I know a lot of uh, elderly people uh, who you can uh, confidently say are, are dumb, you know, and a lot of young people who are very bright. But that's another matter entirely. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yusuf, for joining us.